Over the last two episodes, you've gotten an overview on the top 10 consumer trends for 2023, according to Euromonitor, and heard more details on how three of those trends will have an impact on the hygiene industry. On this episode, which is the last of our three-part series on consumer trends, you'll hear about three more trends that will impact the absorbent hygiene industry and what advice our guests have for adapting these trends to your business. Welcome to Attached to Hygiene, the podcast that enables you to grow your knowledge and influence in the absorbent hygiene industry. My name is Jack Hughes, and my mission is to help you, the absorbent hygiene article producer, design and produce the best possible products to meet the needs of your customers. On today's episode, we're wrapping up our conversation with Li Ying Chien and Ali Angus about the top consumer trends of 2023. Once again, Ali introduced us to the top 10 trends on episode 53. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I'd encourage you to go back and give it a listen so you're familiar with the trends we'll be talking about today. On this episode, both Li Ying and Ali will share three more trends that will have the biggest impact on the hygiene industry and how you can be ready to react as these trends continue to influence consumers of absorbent hygiene products. All right. So the next one on your list, Li Ying, was, was She Rises. And there are so many topics we could talk about for this one. We've We've had, I think, more than half a dozen episodes on the menstrual health market in our podcast. And so I know a lot of our listeners, this wouldn't be a new one for you, but I'm guessing maybe one of the ones that many of our listeners might not be familiar with is kind of the femtech space. And we touched on it a little bit in certain episodes, but we've seen that industry take off along with the traditional period care and menstrual health industry and and those types of products. So I'm curious, have you seen any interesting trends or products coming from femtech that could have a a big impact on absorbent hygiene and the absorbent hygiene industry? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the femtech space is so flourishing right now and so diverse. And to tackle it within even a few minutes is a miracle, right? So I just want to find something I think probably most interesting in the hygiene space. And I think has more immediate, probably impact on the hygiene products, either as inspiration or opportunity or even perhaps disruption in some way. But I do want to say that we don't track femtech from the research perspective, but it's on our radar, especially its intimate connection to the hygiene products. There are a couple of things, trends we are seeing, and some of them are changing how we see absorbent hygiene products as products, not just products for absorbency, but also as tech or medical devices for the purpose of either monitoring, tracking, testing, or risk assessment, right? Another trend includes some new products that are designed to improve the user experience and ultimately the waste efficiency of absorbent hygiene products. They all shape absorbent hygiene in one way or another. And starting with the first trend, we see repositioning disposable absorbent hygiene into tech devices. We see some new products positioned as the health screening monitoring tool. So if we were to give one example, we'll say a lot of these are happening in the tampon space, repositioning tampon as a medicine delivery tool, as something that I know this UK-based brand Calli is exploring, and I'm sure a lot of works are happening right now as well. Because of the intrusive nature of tampon, it provides somewhat natural opportunity for companies to think about how this can become a delivery tool for menstruating consumers, right? And another thing is to use tampons, most commonly tampon, as a risk assessment testing tool. So there's a lot of health puzzles can be deciphered just by the bodily fluid that some consumers give, whether it be menstruation or, or others. Uh, so a lot of brands are actually investigating the possibility of using these disposable products and the information 
it takes from consumers as a leverage of more health, health assessment, health monitoring. So that's developing. And another trend that we see, as I mentioned, is improving technologies used to improve the user experience and waste efficiency of disposable hygiene product. And that's something we mentioned, which is smart wearables. And these products are typically used alongside disposable hygiene products to really help track the symptoms of the hygiene patterns and conditions, as well as provide predictive treatment advice for the caretakers and the users themselves. These products are, I would say, more relatively more developed in the away from home space, but definitely creating a strong market right now as consumers demand more ownership and autonomy in their hygiene routines. Yeah, I think the dual use or dual benefits, I guess, or single use, but dual benefits of some of the hygiene products out there and brands moving into that space to you know, as you said, there's so much information in in bodily fluids and rather than needing to go to a doctor to get blood drawn or whatever, if you can use a product that you're already using regularly anyway to kind of tell you some things and maybe it's not a full on health diagnostic, but it's enough information to kind of lead you in the right direction or encourage you to talk to a doctor or give a doctor you know something to talk to you about. Yeah, I just think that that's so cool. And I think that that'll be a a big, as you said, it's, it's already becoming a big trend and we're seeing more products like that. But I think that'll be continue to grow as some of these traditional absorbent hygiene products combined with femtech technologies or brands and continue to be able to draw more information from these products that billions of people are using every day anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And the boundary of femtech is, is expanding every day. You can say delivery, subscription delivery is also a part of the Fantech universe, providing convenience and personal light or customization. You can also talk about some of the apps, you know, software that hygiene companies provide to track menstrual cycle, the different stages of menopause or maternity, and to give a proper advice and product recommendations, you know, these are all part of this universe and it's expanding every single day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that'll be a really interesting thing. Like five years from now, what kind of information are we gleaning from, from the femtech space? And then has that transferred over into baby care or adult incontinence, which obviously there are plenty of, of applications for similar technologies in those spaces as well. So I think that's a, a really exciting part of the, of the hygiene industry. Yeah, and it dials into the trend of authentic automation, right? There's uh, elements of tech-assisted automation to give consumers more control of their own health and be more in control of their own choices as well. But at the same time, there's element of authenticity, like there's element of human along along this tech-assisted journey where real human beings provide consultation, advice, a sense of community to give consumers a sense of belonging. It's all seamlessly integrated in the journey of hygiene consumption. Yeah. Well, and that's a a good segue into the next category. I know authentic animation was the last one on your list. We still have to touch on Young and Disrupted, but since you mentioned it, I wanted to, yeah, ask a little bit about authentic automation. I think the ability for brands to kind of skirt that line between personalization and automation is is something that it, it's a hard thing to do you know it, you have the convenience of of automation but at some point many people still want to talk to interact with people or at least be treated like a person and not just like a transaction and it can be a hard thing to balance for brands and one of the things that stood out to me was the idea of like robots kind of roaming around stores and maybe making product recommendations or answering questions on products. And I thought that was really cool. I I haven't seen any of that yet, but, uh, you know, I don't see anything rolling around my local retailer. But yeah, I'm just curious what you're seeing there and maybe some of the big impact that you could have on the on the hygiene industry by being able to balance that automation side while, as you said, still being authentic, still having that human touch. Yeah, I think hygiene is still a ways away from bringing automation straight into the retail store. 
but we see a lot of the good combination of human and automation happening online. And one area of that integration is in the customization shopping, right? So as we know, a lot of these hygiene conditions for consumers, there's no universal acknowledgement of, for example, frequency. Sometimes there is a bit of irregularity. What about absorbency, right? The volume of discharge. Sometimes we see the droplets or other descriptions, scoops, things like that. So there's a lack of universal consensus of hygiene conditions. And therefore, a lot of consumers still remain confused about what they're experiencing, how they quantify that and translating that into the uh, final purchase decision. So this is where a lot of the authentic automation come into play. And on the one hand, we have shoppable quizzes, right? Direct-to-consumer websites set up for the consumers as they go through the products and the endless virtual aisles to really narrow down what their routine, right? How often do you have menstruation? What was the last time? Or what's the, how would you describe yourself in terms of lifestyle or the volume of discharge? And what's your other life routines look like? For example, these questions automatically generated through these guided quizzes help consumers really shorten their shopping journey. But at the same time, you will see a lot of these brands have their human consultants or advisors, experts such as nurses or expert sales representatives on the side. If consumer need it, they can go to those uh, real human beings to ask questions about, for example, this is my condition. I can find the answer online in those quizzes. Where should I start? How should I navigate your millions of products, right? So there's this element of human and technology. And together, I think it gives consumer more confidence to go through this shopping journey by themselves. And a lot of times the journey can be really intimidating and inconvenient. So I think it's very much necessary for this to further play out in hygiene and is still somewhat limited within the audience who is more tax savvy and at least knowing how to navigate online. But then how do we bring that into stores? Well, that will be something we can talk about maybe a couple of years from now, maybe even sooner. Absolutely. And yeah, I think your your comments on kind of guiding consumers along that journey and getting them to the right product. I mean, I know we've done some interviews with people in the adult incontinence industry, and I think that's a big issue there is transparency on products is like, okay, what one company calls a brief, another company calls a pull up. And, you know, what are the difference between these products? What's right for me? I have no idea what the volume of my incontinence is. So how the heck am I supposed to know? So the more brands can do that and you're starting to see that, but I think the more brands can do that and try and explain the features or or the type of product you need in a very simple way that, you know, someone who isn't in the industry can can understand. And I think that, you know, you're going to see more success there. And as you were talking, I, I thought of, you know, could we see technology get to a point where the kind of combining femtech and authentic automation, where based on the volume of urine or feces that a baby is expelling into the diaper, does it know when to order the next size up of a diaper or the next level of ador- absorbency? Or does a, a technology know when your menstrual cycle is going to end and then, you know, when you might need products later on? And so you don't have to worry about ordering them or can understand things about your flow that, you know, okay, maybe you need a larger product or a more absorbent product or something like that. And I think some consumers may get a little freaked out about some of that, the, uh, the kind of personal nature of, of some of that, but some might really like that and just the convenience of not having to worry about it and kind of the very coolness, if you will, of technology and its ability to, to understand some of that stuff. I think, like you said, maybe in a few years, we're talking about that. And that's like the next big thing is uh, kind of automatically ordering based on the product is telling you about, yeah. about yourself. Yeah. There's an example. Sorry. There's an example I just want to throw in. It's, it's not from your industry, but L'Oreal has what they call is sensation. 
It's a YSL, um, neuroscience headset. Oh. And consumers go into the store and they have this headset. Then they are given by a store assistant various scent families. So it could be a woodsy smell or a floral smell. And the headset monitors the emotional reaction of, of the user <laughs> to that scent. And then based on that, then the assistants and the, the results tell or suggest then what perfumes to buy. And, and now that's kind of out there, but that's the kind of that neuroscience, you know, femtech, whatever it might be. That's where technology is taking us, right? So, yeah. and, and that type of technology solution could be applied to a lot of markets and the, including the hygiene industry, I'm sure. Yeah. It kind of links to what you were saying. Absolutely agree. And it's a virtual cycle is that it serves the customer, but ultimately it helps brands to develop, to fine tune their product, their portfolio, yeah. potentially creating more variety of goods for the purpose of diversity and inclusivity at some point, right? And then from there, there's no more demand for automation, authentic automation to help consumers even narrow down even more to what they like and what they want. It's self-discovery tool yes. to help consumers know what they don't know or what they don't know that should know, but don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you need and this is what you want, but you just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Leanne, you made the comment earlier about all these trends being connected. I think in that, you know, two minute statement, you touched on three or four of them. So it's just crazy how they all just kind of relate and, and can kind of work off of each other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Before we move on to the sixth and final trend impacting hygiene, I want to mention this episode's sponsor, Cotton Incorporated's Cottonworks. Cottonworks is the trusted free online resource for the textile, apparel, and non-wovens industry. With hundreds of easy-to-search resources at your fingertips, Cottonworks is your go-to tool for producing outstanding cotton products. Are you interested in exploring cotton for your hygiene needs? Find free sourcing directories by visiting cottonworks.com slash non-wovens dash sourcing. Discover what's possible with cotton. Create a free account today at cottonworks.com. Now, the last in your six of the 10 trends that really kind of touch on hygiene more specifically is young and disrupted. And I want to read a, this is a short quote from the actual report that stood out to me. And it said, Gen Z is immune to traditional advertising. Authenticity and social impact make a difference. They want to feel a genuine connection when engaging with brands, and these outspoken shoppers aren't afraid to voice concerns. More than one-third shared their opinions on social or political issues on social media last year. That is a, a huge thing brands have had to adjust to because it's, you know, obviously the rise of social media, you see things like that. But I think, Ali, as you mentioned earlier, like Gen Z, they're, they're just not afraid to, to share their opinion, and they're going to put it out there. And probably a bit more forward than than some people and probably challenge brands a bit more, not just on product performance or whatever, but on social issues. And so this is something brands have had to adjust to. And I'm curious whether it's in that realm or or some other realm related to this, you know, Gen Z and Young and Disruptive, what are we seeing in in the hygiene industry and how brands are trying to target this, you know, this increasingly important and increasingly influential group of, of consumers. This is a almost catch it all trend, right? It's about a very unique and strong vocal demographic who is very aware of all these going on, whether it be value or automation or eco-economic sustainability, et cetera. But I think most prominently within this Gen Z rising and influencing the hygiene industry, the products, the branding. And I think there are a few ways that we see a lot of changes and transformations in terms of how companies importantly reach the consumers and involve them, giving them a sense of belonging and stakeholding even. And I think from a marketing standpoint, for example, there's a increased usage of ordinary underrepresented humans in the campaign to really promote the sense of authenticity, inclusivity to the Gen Zs who, who really look for that 
true sense of connection and emotional connection with the brands. We see a lot of brands using open conversations, online forums to build the community, opening up conversations that we people wouldn't have had 10 years ago, such as how do you properly use menstrual cups, for example, or what it's like to have period as transgender. You know, these are the topics that you wouldn't normally address for a consumer base that's more conservative and introverted, right? So another thing we see more and more spearheaded by a lot of direct consumer brand is to involve consumers, especially Gen Z, into the product innovation and even fundraising activities. So some uprising brands would ask on Instagram, Facebook, and even WhatsApp, in some cases, what product innovation you are looking for or what other products, what kind of partnerships you are most expecting for us to do. And they will take that responses and act on some of them that they perceive most valuing. Or in some cases, they will say, hey, we are raising funds, but we want our consumers to have a stake in our company and feeling more involved and respect it, right? So they go on fundraising platform and and calling younger consumers to vote and respond directly to their purposes. Those are a lot of things brands are doing to really involve this unique cohort of Gen Z, diverse, but also very progressive and vocal generally. So I think it's transferring the industry in terms of marketing narrative, brand positioning, but also increasingly the product they deliver to the consumers. Yeah, it sounds like a lot more, it sounds like a lot of new things that brands maybe haven't had to deal with before. And just, oh, okay, we, you know, maybe stuff we talk about, quote unquote, behind closed doors, we now have to be a bit more open about. And some, you know, a customer is actually going to ask us and and not just ask us in a phone call or an email, they're going to ask us on social media where literally everyone can see it and we have to be able to respond to that. And and not just that, but they're not going to be okay with a kind of fluff canned PR answer. They want a legitimate answer. And I mean, it's good. I love it, but it's a new thing for brands and these major producers to adjust to. And and if you if you can't, you might struggle to succeed because this is a their purchasing power is growing. The number of consumers is growing. Their influence is growing. We as companies are going to have to adjust to this new style of purchasing and accountability from Gen Z to to succeed. And like I said, I think it's great. I, I like where it's going, but it's uh, it's still an adjustment, even for someone who who likes it. I think the point, Jack, as well, is like you do have to, brands do have to say, tell them what this is, what we're doing. But actually, they need to prove it. Ah, yeah. And this is the thing with Gen Z, right? Words are great. Where's the action? And that's what they really need to get the trust. And if you get the trust, you've broken down their barriers. Yeah. So Great point. Yeah. Very great point. Yeah. yeah. Not just words, but actions. Yeah. Yeah. It does put the brands in a more vulnerable position, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, if yeah. you have them, you have them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And bearing in mind, they're the people, they're not just your next consumers, they're your employees, your next your next business partners, your next employees. Yeah. So you have to prove it right across the board and, and engage with them in it, all those different environments, right? So. Absolutely. That's a great, great point. Both great points. With that, I have one final question. And I guess it'll be... If you have one recommendation for absorbent hygiene producers based on the top 10 trends this year, obviously, besides reading the report, if they haven't read it already, they need to read the report. But if you have one recommendation for absorbent hygiene producers, what would that be? And and Allie, we'll, we'll start with you. I would say, obviously, yeah, don't just read the report. It's important to understand the trends, really understand, delve in behind them understand the sub-trends behind them, understand what the manifestations are behind it, both within your industry, but outside as well. And also the driving forces of those changing behaviours. So we talked about technology, we've talked about different population groups. They are in the, the drivers that make us change our behaviour. So understand the trends, but assess the drivers and look at what others are doing. That's what I would say. Great. Absolutely. Not just read it, 
understand it, figure out what the impact on your business is going to be. Yeah. Break it down and check what it means to you. Compare it to your own products. Compare it to your industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And Lee? I resonate. And I think that what Ali mentioned at the very beginning of this discussion is that for a company within the industry, it's important to broaden the eye set beyond that horizon of the industry, right? You might be able to take inspiration from not just adjacencies, but another industry completely out of your universe. And that can be something very inspirational and beneficial in the long-term thinking. So I think that will be one thing I like to highlight again. And another thing is each of these trends manifest differently for different companies across the supply chain within absorbent hygiene, whether you are the supplier, the manufacturer, the distributor, the brands, the retailer, they may mean very different things to you, even if you all touch the one same end product. So do think from your perspective and think about what that really means to you. And if you do think there's a lot more to be talked about and deciphered, I would encourage you to have more conversation with more stakeholders and players within the industry. You know, companies and people really studying the industry and have the conversation about these these trends and what they mean to you and pass that along through the industry will be really a good practice for everyone. Yeah, I can't really state it much better than that. I think uh, how you can take it and you know have more conversations and get more input and as you said, find ways to think outside the box and take examples from other companies or other industries. It's, it's only gonna drive the industry, not just absorbent hygiene, but any industry forward. And you know that's what we have to do to advance. So that's fantastic advice. So. Ali Liying, I really want to thank you for your time, the thought and effort you put into answering my questions and and preparing. And I, I know this was a long conversation, but I I really appreciate you you both sticking with me and sticking with our audience to educate them on the trends on the trends overall and the impact on the hygiene industry. So thank you so much, both of you, for your time. And uh, I hope we can have you both on the show again soon. Thank you, Jack. It was a pleasure. So there you have it. Over the last three episodes, you should have gotten a nice overview of 10 consumer trends and more details on six of those trends that will have an impact on the absorbent hygiene industry specifically. You also just heard takeaways from two people who are living and breathing these trends and changes in absorbent hygiene. Knowing about these trends and their impact on hygiene should give you a leg up to adapt accordingly and succeed in our increasingly competitive industry. Attached to Hygiene is brought to you by Bostic and is hosted by me, Jack Hughes. It is produced and edited by me with the help of Liz Bruner and Paul Andrews at Bostic and Michelle Tonkovitz, Emery Chernis, and Nikki Ackerman at Green Onion Creative. Post-production for Attached to Hygiene is done by Podcast Boutique. Our theme music is by Jonathan Boyle. Once again, we'd like to extend a special thank you to our guests today, Ali Angus and Li Ying Chien. You can follow both Ali and Li Ying on LinkedIn, and you can learn more about Euromonitor on their website at euromonitor.com. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.